What's it like to be a pro shooter? Shooting long range competition, pistol competition, and probably one of the coolest new ranges out there being built. We're going to talk all that right now with Doug Koenig. This Gun Talk Nation is brought to you by Safari Land, Timney Triggers, the world's finest triggers, and Pyramid Air. Today, we've got a world champion with us, and it's not me. That's right. <laughs> Doug Koenig from Ruger. Welcome in, man. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Thanks for being here. So, um, people probably know who you are if they follow guns and shooting competitions and all that stuff, but Doug, give them a little background about yourself, and I'm kind of curious to talk about how did you get into this, because it's always an interesting thing for, there's only a handful that are really full-time professional shooters and, uh, you know, you're an overnight success over, over three decades or something. Right. Like yeah. That. That's kind of my, <laughs> my line. I tell people it's taken me 30 years to be an overnight success. Yeah. So, I mean, the long and short of it, you know, I, as a kid, I was always into, into guns and bows and, uh, just kind of follow that. And, and, you know, for me, my father had some guns, did a little bit of hunting, but he wasn't, you know, I wouldn't say he was a hunter or a shooter at all. Okay. But, but the good thing for me is my parents were always supportive of whatever myself or my three brothers we wanted to do. And, you know, my uncle, one of my uncles was a big hunter. My grandpa hunted. So, you know, when my brothers and I, uh, older brothers wanted to, you know, kind of do our hunter safety and, and do all that. My dad was there, took us, sat through it. And I, I still remember even the first uh, day of deer season in Pennsylvania that we went out and sat behind our house. It was pouring rain. My dad, you know, he was a big guy. He was like 300 pounds. He was a big guy, uh -huh. six, three, something like that. But, you know, he's sitting out there with an umbrella. And I'm like, Dad, I don't, I don't know if you really need to have this big, you know, blue umbrella out here. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to see a whole lot of deer. But um, it was it was pretty funny. But he, he did anything and whatever – you know, whatever he could do to support us. But I was always the one that was really drawn not only to the hunting, but just to shoot. I just wanted to shoot. I mean, fortunately I live pretty rural and we could shoot 22s and stuff like that in the backyard and mm -hmm. we could really shoot kind of anything. Some neighbors didn't like when I shot, you know, 44 mags and stuff like that, but they kind of got over it after a few, you know, uh, calls to the police. They got camp. used to it. Just <laughs> Doug doing his thing over there. Exactly. Right. So, um, but really how I got started is, is I was the one out of the, out of the family that was really kind of drawn to the handgun stuff. And I kind of talked my dad into, I was working for him at the time. I said, Hey, you know, I want to get a 1911 pistol. And we had a local gun shop right up the road, Baylor precision. Mm -hmm. And those guys did, you know, custom gun work and were heavily involved in the competitive shooting, you know, world, you know, Camp Perry, Bianchi, stuff like that. They did a lot of work. So they kind of opened that world to you perhaps a little bit. I mean, did you know that that world existed before? I, I had no clue that yeah. it existed. I went up there to, to buy a pistol because another sporting goods store that we had used to frequent a lot was, had kind of gone out of business, changed hands. So we went up there. I saw I wanted a, you know, a Colt government stainless 45. That's yeah. what I wanted. And so we ordered it. And back then, kind of like it is now, um, you know, it took took a few weeks for the gun to come in. You know, what they didn't, you know, people didn't have lots of guns. We didn't have, you know, the Cabela's and Bass Pro and right. Sportsman's Warehouse where you could walk in and see 50 handguns on the shelves. Now, again, maybe not today, but, yeah, right. you know, eight months ago, we in could normal see that. Times. In normal times. So... <laughs> I waited, and as I waited there, you know, they had just got back from an Ipsic World shoot, which was held that year in Orlando. So they had the course book, and they were kind of talking to me. Well, I'm 17 years old at the time, and I'm like, wow, you're, you can, you're running around, you're doing mag changes, you're jumping over cars and, you know, climbing walls and doing all this, you know, Ipsic stuff. And I'm like, wow, that I'd love to try that. Yeah. So, you know, fortunately for me, Frank Baylor, you know, uh, gave me, you know, a a holster and a belt and some mag pouches and extra mags and, and kind of really got me started. You know, luckily we had some local matches, uh, one every weekend within about an hour drive. And, and basically, you know, I went with him to a few of the matches and like anything, all of a sudden there's a group of guys, you know, it's right. like a hunting camp instead of one guy. Now we've got five or six going to this match and maybe eight or nine or 10 going to this match. And after you shoot the match, we go eat something, so to me, that was my introduction and that's how I got started. And, the, and I mean, and total truth, 
once I got into it, it wasn't that, oh, hey, I want to I want to win. I want to be good. I want to beat everybody. It was like, I can go to a match and shoot 300 rounds in one day. Holy crap. I'm, I'm in. And they'll, know? and they have, I have all these cool targets and I get to do stuff that you don't normally do on a, on a shooting range. I wasn't even aware of it. You know, yeah. the, the, probably the closest thing is, is what I had seen as a kid on, you know, one of the dirty Harry movies, you know, when they, they shoot the police combat stuff, right? You see something like that in a movie and to actually have something somewhat similar, but you know, like you're saying, set up steel targets, poppers, swingers, you know, paper targets, and then have the physical part of it, Mm -hmm. you know, being, you know, coming from an athletic family, we played baseball, football, soccer, you know, did all that kind of stuff, wrestled. So to tie that in with shooting was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of a no brainer. And, and really for me, I, I think because I loved hunting so much, but hunting season was so short, you know, legally, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania to where I really needed something else to do. And once I got into the shooting, I mean, it, it was definitely, it had me hooked, you know, for sure. And it's different with hunting. If you, I think there are those people who they're hunters. They really enjoy hunting. They also enjoy shooting guns and hunters don't shoot a lot of rounds. If you think about it, like the, the, the old school traditional, like deer hunter, you can have a box of ammo for a couple seasons. A couple, yeah. so, you know, you depending on your gun, gun you, you could have you it for 10 years, years right? Yeah. yeah. If you check your zero and you go out and shoot a deer with it, it's yeah. Those guys, you know, the ammo companies aren't making any money on those guys. Right. Exactly. Know? It's a different deal. And that's why it, these days when we talk about, oh, I need to get a 500 rounds or a thousand rounds and people who aren't into it don't, maybe don't understand like, well, that's a lot. Right. Like, no, it's like a weekend. Right. It's, it's not that much. I mean, and, and even on the on the negative side, when you see something in the news where they say, well, they, they got this guy, he had five guns and 2,000 rounds of ammo, I'm going like, well, that's in my truck right now. I'm right. headed to the range. I right. mean, I've got 500 rounds of this. You know, that's, it's like a mechanic having, you know, how many wrenches does he have in his toolbox? Yeah. You know, that's, he had a, it's a bag of nails. I mean, <laughs> that, yeah, you're going to use them. That's exactly right. So, and, and I think for me, I, one of the things that always, you know, I tried to tie in whether it's with TV show of mine or, or what I was doing is to get the hunters to shoot and the shooters to hunt, to mm-hmm. tie those worlds. Cause when I started, it was two separate worlds. You yeah. know, the guys that hunted, just like you're saying, traditional, you know, they didn't actually shoot that much. They were only shot at game and barely sighted their guns in a lot of, I mean, I'm not saying they didn't sight them in, but it's not like oh, what was good last year. I shot a deer. They didn't feel the need to go right. check it. It just wasn't, the thought process of at the time and um you know same with guys that bird hunted dove hunted you know they only shot what they shot and on the flip side the shooters all they did was shoot 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 and and didn't really understand you know the hunters and the solitude and the and what they love from the outdoors and on that side and to me i was a a mix i still am a mix of Mm -hmm. both and have always tried to promote that and tie those two worlds together and i think these days more than ever we need those two worlds to get on the same page and cooperate when it comes to because they try to pit us against each other when it comes to gun rights and restrictions and all that stuff they'll go and and there will be there there are sometimes are the the hunter crowd who goes well i don't really have any use for choose something an ar-15 or whatever right and it's like well i understand you don't use it but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't support the shooter side of things. Correct. You know, um, how do you think, I mean, how have you kind of, you've been doing this. How do you bridge that gap and kind of get those two sides coming together a little bit more? Just, just really trying to make them aware of, of both sides because of that, having that conversation. Because again, when I started the old school, old time hunter, that was the exact thing. Who needs, who needs more than five shots in a gun? It just was what they were brought up at. They Mm -hmm. didn't, and the way they looked at it, it had nothing to do with shooting. But then, you know, as that crowd evolved and we got a younger generation come through, you take that group that typically hunts and you get them to the range and you show them competitions on TV and on the internet now, but things like that, that they never saw before. Right. I mean, just look at the evolution of the shooting TV shows and be able to get match coverage to where they can now see us use our tools for fun and sport. Yeah. And they go, Oh wow, that's really cool. I can't tell you. I mean, really I, through my career, just whether I'm at a, a store opening for Bass Pro or, or any event dealer 
distributor show, people are just like, you know, I, you know, all I ever did was hunt, but I, you know, I, I got a 1022 and I'm, I'm out plank and now I'm shooting steel with it. Now yeah. I'm doing this. And now they understand, they get it. They see it. They see the fun in it. They, they're really hooked on it. And, and then on the flip side, you know, I, I, I knew a lot of shooters that, you know, maybe weren't as cognizant of, of the process of where you get your food and, and doing all that. I'm, I'm not saying that they didn't know how they get their food, but, you know, to go out and hunt, shoot something, skin it, you know, quarter it, butcher it yourself, know the whole process, be mm-hmm. part of the process. You know, you can't have, I've had people say, well, I'm anti-hunting. I don't like to see mouths. I'm like, but you eat at McDonald's. Yeah. I'm like, well, you're a meat eater. Yeah. What's the difference? Oh, well, they're raised for that. Well, I mean, says who? I mean, wh- <laughs> the, where do you come up with Did the cow get a vote? <laughs> right. I mean, where did that justification come right. from? I mean, it depends how you look at it, but, you know, wildlife is there, you know, for multiple purposes mm-hmm. and we manage it correctly. We can consume them. And and, and hunters are the wildlife managers of, 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 you know, nature right now. I mean, we are the apex predator and we actually decide, we have wildlife biologists go, this is, we studied it. This is the appropriate amount to take. This is the the amount of animals we need to take right. for the, for the health of the population. I wanted to go back to something. Um, we've heard this, you've heard it. People who are not into it as much as we are, but they'll say, oh yeah, I grew up around guns or I grew up shooting. I grew up hunting. So you were that guy. You were that, that guy as a teenager. Um, yeah, I shoot some, I hunt some, but how is it different from, well, yeah, I, I know how to load and make a gun go off right. versus training and learning the guns and becoming actually good at it. So, I mean, from, from my perspective or, you know, to kind of evolve on, on my story is, you know, once I got into that introduction of the competitive shooting and started shooting matches you know, it, it was natural to me. I, I won't debate that. I mean, I had a lot of natural talent, ability. To me, shooting seemed very easy. You line up the sights, you squeeze the trigger, and you don't disturb it, mm-hmm. right? And, and the gun goes bang. It, it's a it's a piece of equipment. It's a machine. If the sights are lined up and sighted in, and when you pull the trigger, nothing moves, it's going to hit where the sights are, right? Very simple. Yeah. There's, no, there's no magic in it. You just have to execute that perfectly every time. So, but, you know, through the training, I, you know, I got to a level right away, um, you know, locally. I went to my first USPSA nationals. I think I finished 12th or something. My first steel challenge, I was, I think, top five. But I quickly saw that my natural ability uh, got me to a point, but there was, uh, there was going to be a next step process. And, you know, I'd, I'd taken one of Tommy Campbell's classes and then uh, either how you look at it, fortunate or unfortunately, you know, I, I ran into Robbie. Oh, Mr. Latham. Exactly. At a match in Virginia. We all feel that way about him. Uh, we, I mean, I'm not it, sure it's if a it's hate. fortunate or unfortunate, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> it's Actually, it's total love. I love the dude. So, um, you know, I met him at a, a match and obviously knew who he was because I was a new guy in the sport. He was ahead of you by a few years as far as his career and yeah, shooting. Yeah, he was He was five to seven years. He'd already won, you know, world championships, uh, nationals, uh, a Bianchi by then. So, you know, he was he was that person, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was, he was that guy. So, and we just, you know, started talking and I ended up, going out there, actually Frank Ballard and I, you know, went out and took one of Robbie's classes and, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of connected and, and started shooting a little bit more together. And, and then I started to shoot for Springfield and, you know, from my side of the career, you know, path, it just, you know, I was fortunate to, you know, meet, meet some bright people and put that in to context or together with my work ethic, you know, because no matter who you know, who you shoot with, whatever knowledge is there. If you don't, if you don't grind, and mm-hmm. if you don't enjoy the grind, you're you're not going to get to that next level. I mean, there's no substitute for the hard work, no matter what it is in life that you're doing. Period. And I I'm a believer in that. And I think for me, the real eye opener, you know, even though I had some good finishes and and things like that, but in, you know, the part of the story I tell is in 1989 there was a match. Ironically, Springfield Armory sponsored it called the Trophy Challenge. It was out in California, and it was kind of basically we were using what is now IDPA targets. Okay, and it was all done by time, 
and and the steel targets. So it was it was basically a time. You know, you were subtracting anything outside. So it was it was really time event, uh, like an Ipsic timed event instead of scoring points. So you know, everybody's there. Robbie was there. You know, Brian Enos, Plaxco, Barnhart, the whole that all the whole, big sh- pistol shooters of their time. Uh, the heavy hitters, right? Yeah. The, the the Peyton Manning, Tom Brady's of the of the football world. That was in the shooting world, and that's who was there. And I I won the match, and I was like, wow, okay. I mean, I I can do this. Mm-hmm. I can do this. I'm now. I, I understand. I'm starting to understand. And and you know, one of the things shooting with Robbie and just being around that level of a shooter and watch how they prepare, you know that tied in with my work ethic, you know, really kind of was the light bulb moment for me. And then, you know, fortunately for me the next year, I won Bianchi that year, 1990, shot the first perfect score in history. You've, you've won a few Bianchis. I, I've won a few now, you know, <laughs> all the gray hairs in my beard tell the tale. You so know. <laughs> Bianchi is an interesting one. I mean, it was, I, I don't know, you know, what it's considered now, but it's always been one of, or, or the biggest uh, pistol shooting competition out there and it's it's an interesting mix of being accurate and and being able to maybe go fast enough it's not super speed stuff but it's this it's this it's a tough challenge from what it's been described to me as the accuracy bullseye type shooters it's like can I shoot this fast and then the the you know speed shooter guys are going can I shoot this slow and accurate right and mm-hmm. All right. So, how many times have you won it? I've won it eighteen. Yeah, eighteen. <laughs> so, and that and that's a great question. I mean, I think it, it is that perfect blend. But you know, and and to uh, mirror the, the the bullseye shooters with the speed shooters, and that's how that course of fire came together. And even even for me at this point, there's there's strings uh, in that course of fire where I'd like to have a little more time. I feel like I could ex- execute the shots even better. Uh, and then there's some time limits where I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm done way early and it's just, it's too much time, but it is, it's an intimidating course of fire from a standpoint. It's very unforgiving. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and at the level the shooters are at now, you have in open class for sure, you're shooting perfect scores and it comes down to X count. So for those that don't know about the match, you know, we're shooting uh, an NRA D one target. So the 10 ring is an basically the size of an eight inch plate. And then inside that is a four inch X ring. So there's four stages, 48 rounds per stage, 192 rounds, 10 points, you know, for a 10. So your perfect score can be a 1920 and then however many X's you have. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which are in the middle of the target. So to win the match, you have to shoot a 1920. So you have to keep all 192 rounds all in, in the, the 10, 10 ring. ring. Absolute. No <laughs> doubt. And you really need to be in that, you know, upper 170 X count. I mean, the X counts have been a little weak. You and know? the X doesn't add to your points. It's just counting the X. It's the tiebreaker, basically. Gotcha. So if there's yeah. three of us that shoot clean, it's going to come down to ha- how many X's you had, which means who shot more in the middle of the target. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's, you know, we've had some great scores over the years. Uh, I think I, I still hold the world record at 188 X's out of 192 and a 187 at the just national to, level. Just <laughs> to give the listeners an idea for, for me, um, at what is the furthest distance that you shoot the mover? Uh, the mover, we shoot out to 25 yards, 25 yards, a mover going 60 feet and six seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Moving left to right or right to left. Both. I guess both, right? Yep, both okay. ways, both directions yeah. you have to shoot. And you still have to keep it in the 10 ring and hopefully in the X. Yeah, we, we typically, when you have a good run, you're going to shoot 43 Xs, you know, or a little better, hopefully. Yeah. So <laughs> on the mover. And then on the practical, we're shooting out to 50 yards. So. Lord have mercy. <laughs> and uh, always open division? I, I, I pretty much always shoot open. Uh, there's been a few years where I've shot two gun and shot metallic. Um, so you're starting to figure out the red dot on a gun. I've got that figured (laughs) out. Well, that, that's an interesting story. Uh Okay. The the whole red dot thing. I, and I've had many conversations over the last, you know, couple of years with people that, you know, that talk about red dots and how it's this new thing. And of course we're seeing it transition more into military police and now general people in concealed carry. But I, I just laugh. I said, you know, I won my first, you know, my first and only, but an Ipsic world championship in 1990, 
with a red dot on my gun. Yeah. And a month earlier, Jerry Barnhart won the USPSA Nationals with a red dot. Yeah. So <laughs> we were kind of the first two. You know, we were using red dots at Bianchi because the time limits were more generous and you could do it. Everybody said, oh, you can't shoot this for steel. You can't shoot it for Ipsic. No way we'll be fast enough. And as soon as we put them on our guns, and, and funny, you know, Jerry and I practiced together uh, maybe three or four days uh, before the Nationals. He won the Nationals, and then, uh, you know, like I said, I won the World Shoot in Australia that year. So I've had a lot of history with shooting red dots, you know, on handguns and everything else. But it's interesting to see how that has evolved to what it is now, how small they are, how great mm -hmm. they are. You know, and, and here's the funny thing about that. Back in the day... We all took Tasco PDP twos and they would never last. I mean, right. they go on the gun, 50 rounds, hundred rounds, they go out. Yeah. They wouldn't, or wouldn't hold zero. So and the quality a, has changed dramatically. Dramatically. We used to, there was a fellow Ross Dean lived in California who was an electronics guy. He, be, he made a business out of building and fixing. Rebuilding. Yeah, yeah. We don't, I'd go buy five Tascos and send them to him and have him bulletproof them. Yeah. And that's what we'd all do. I mean, that's the only way they'd last. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, exactly. But yeah. through that technology and that learning curve, you have what you have now. You know, the the loophole Delta Point Pros and and RMRs and all the different stuff out there that's really good, really Super strong. rugged. Oh Super my God. rugged. Hey, this Gun Talk Nation is brought to you by several great companies. Timney Triggers, made in America since 1946, I think. It's a long time. Um, also, Timney offers a lifetime guarantee which you got to like that, especially the way we use gear these days, your hunting gear, your competition gear. Um, that's a big deal, and it, it shows that they stand behind it. Their latest trigger is the Glock Alpha Competition Series trigger, and this is for Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5 Glocks. It's one of the things that probably you can do that would be the easiest, quickest way to help improve your shooting, especially if you're going to be doing some competition shooting. Also, Gun Talk Nation is brought to you by ATN, ATN Optics, the future of optics. They've got all these smart HD optics, thermal, night vision. Now, ATN goes mossy. They actually have mossy oak camo patterns on their scopes, which is really cool because ultimately a lot of this stuff is being used for hunting these days. So check out atncorp.com for some pretty sweet deals on thermal and night vision. That's, uh, that's some game changer stuff. And if you've never used thermal especially... Um, I don't think I've ever met somebody who bought thermal and didn't buy a second one. <laughs> you got to end up really getting into it. Also, pyramidair.com. Pyramid Air is your one-stop shop for all things air gun. And that could mean a training pistol, like a Glock 19 Gen 3 CO2 BB air pistol. Yep. Fits in the holster, train with it, that kind of thing. And they've got Springfield Armories and Rugers and, and Berettas and all kinds of stuff. Also hunting guns. Um, but here's one for you. How about full auto? Did you know that you can have full auto in an air gun? And it's not like some crazy uh, ATF, NFA item. That's pretty cool. So check them out at PyramidAir.com. Enter Gun Talk Nation at checkout for $10 off any $50 purchase. We appreciate their support. You're a pistol guy, except that now you're <laughs> you you're just a shooter. But really, is what it is. You have not dabbled into PRS. You seem to be deep into it. Is that fair? That's that's a polite assessment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, precision rifle. What is it about it? Why have you just dove into this with with both feet and hands and everything? Well. I think for me, it's because it's a, a great mix again. You know, the, the time limits are all workable. You have to be precision. You know, you have to be able to shoot. And you, it's, and you have to be able to build a position, and there's movement involved. So it's like a mini IPSC stage mm -hmm. with a long rifle at small targets at long, long distances. You got to learn when. You got to learn the dope on your gun. So to me, it's, it's so much different than what I've done with a handgun. And then it also follows into, I love to hunt. I love to, you know, long range hunt, big game hunt. So it all kind of follows into that theme yeah. for me. And I'm, I'm totally addicted to it. Totally. What's your setup? Uh, what's your, cause it, it's, this is another sp sport and shooting that's gear heavy. I mean, and, and I think people like to talk about the gear. Yeah. I mean, it, it's gear heavy. So the, in PRS, uh, the precision rifle series. So 
That's you know you have that in the NRL, the two different uh, organizations. Um, so they've got open class, which is open and it all goes any rifle, any caliber. They do have a speed limit, so it doesn't destroy the targets. Mm-hmm. Um, any optic, and then you have tactical class, which you have to shoot two two three or three oh eight. Same deal. It can be you know any any rifle, any configuration, and then they have a production class, which is what I shoot in. Okay. I ch- and you know, that is a factory gun. Now the rules have been changing throughout the last few years. So currently uh, it's a factory gun, $2,500 uh, top price limit on the gun. It's like a retail price or retail, something. Yeah, MSRP, yeah. yeah, retail price on the rifle. Um, you, to be a manufacturer, you got to have a manufacturer's license. You've got to manufacture at least 50 rifles okay. a year because there's there was some gray areas in the rule over the past few years, and it's anything. There wasn't many people shooting production. And then when I got into the PRS, I looked at that as, well, I'm shooting a production gun. I'm shooting a factory Ruger RPR. Yeah. Okay, so why would I, why would I not shoot in production? I mean, it, to me, it's not set up on – your skill set on what class you shoot in or what division you shoot in. It's set up on your equipment. I'm like, well, this is a great platform. And I also had another agenda. I mean, my agenda was multi-level. One, I wanted to kind of gain some exposure to the production class. I, I wanted to shoot in a class where, you know, somebody can go to Bass Pro Sportsman's Warehouse and buy a rifle and put a loophole scope on and buy factory Hornady ammo and, go shoot a match and be yeah. competitive. Yeah, I think that's to me and maybe it's just because this is where I come from. I'm not I'm not a big like gunsmith kind of guy. I'm kind of like a off the rack. What could I do with this gun, right. this box of ammo, this scope and just go shoot. Exactly, you know, and I and I think that drove me and and on that same token, you know, to follow that line is I wanted to prove or try to prove that you don't have to spend a lot of money to be competitive and that a factory gun can be extremely competitive to a level, you know, I, I'm, you know, okay. So I have a different skill set. You know, I'm a pro. Mm-hmm. I've been shooting a long time. I like to feel like I have pretty good trigger control and uh, competition experience, but I'm still, you know, finishing top 20, top 15, sometimes top 10 overall with a production gun against, right. against all the open, you know, shooters. And my goal, I mean, I'm not hiding it. My goal would to win a two day national match shooting a production gun. That's, and it's not for my ego, but it's, it's more for the statement to show people you don't need to spend 10 grand to go compete. You can spend a few thousand bucks and have equipment that you can go compete and shoot and have a great time and hit a lot of targets. And again, I think a lot of people, most people are like you where they just want to take something they can go buy and off the shelf factory ammo, or maybe they'll load whatever the deal is, but, and maybe they'll evolve. Maybe after they do it for a couple of years, they, where they can appreciate a more refined rifle. And I think that's a path, you know, if you get into it, you're not going to just, just stay with the status quo that you got off the rack. I mean, you're going to start messing with it, whether it's reloading or you're going to rebarrel, or you're going to change a trigger, or you're going to do all these things. Right. Um, but as a place to get started, most people aren't starting with some sort of custom, I'm shooting six millimeter BR, whatever stuff right. that's hard to find. They're going to go, I just, I want to try to see if I like it. Absolutely. That's exactly right. I mean, I guess the, the analogy would be if you've, if you just got your driver's license and somebody stuck you in an Indy car right. and said, go drive this thing, you wouldn't be able to appreciate what that Indy car can do because you haven't even driven a normal vehicle, mm-hmm. right? So if you just, just because you have the money and you have a buddy that's got a, you know, GA precision rifle and, you know, whatever caliber and you go do that and you spend 10 grand, you get all that stuff and you don't know how to shoot, you're not really going to appreciate what is going on. You know, start out. What I like to tell them, if you got 10 grand, spend two grand on your equipment and eight grand on ammo yeah. and go learn to shoot. Go, go take a lesson, time. get trigger time, learn the game, and then see what happens. The RPR, the Ruger RPR, I was having this conversation with actually just a, a boat mechanic guy the other day. And he, he was, oh, you do gun stuff. I have the RPR. That gun shoots better than it should. Mm-hmm. And everybody says that about that gun. 100%. <laughs> I mean... Up until, you know, late, late last year, I was shooting our factory off the shelf 
gun because it's production. You can't change the trigger. You Mm -hmm. can't, you know, there's things you can't do in the rules. And my guns shoot great. I mean, I feel like they shoot great. I mean, for a factory gun, my guns will shoot five, six, maybe on a bad day, seven inches at a thousand. Yeah. I mean, for a factory gun. I mean, that's, (laughs) to me, that's sick, you know. And now we've got, you know, we launched the new custom shop version, which has trigger tech trigger, APA brake. We actually have a one in seven uh, stainless 26 inch barrel. Yep. Um, so, you know, it's a little more refined. I mean, I like the, I like a little bit better trigger on a gun. I think that's a, a sure. big enhancement and I think the shooters can appreciate it. But again, it's a factory production gun that comes off the shelf. My gun's no different than anybody else's. I'll shoot anybody's RPR if they got it. It's, yeah. it's the same and they do shoot. It's remarkable. And I think it's a testament and I'm obviously not just Pump and Ruger, they're a great company, but a lot of the manufacturing across the board from when I started to shoot to where it is now, whether it's in the handgun, but especially on the rifle side, you know, if you wanted a rifle to shoot under an inch at 100, you know, if you were trying to get a hunting setup, I mean, you, you had to start looking at custom guns. Right. They're just, the manufacturing processes wasn't there or the care of wanting to get to that level wasn't there maybe the as expectation. much either. The expectation, yeah. exactly. So, you know, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago, for sure 20 years ago, but even 10 years ago, hey, I'm going to give you a factory gun and you're going to be able to go shoot, you know, a five, six inch group at a thousand yards with a factory rifle. I would have told them they were totally full of crap. There's no way anybody could do that. Yeah. And I mean, literally, I can't tell you how many, you know, I say go through RPRs. I mean, I've got obviously a bunch of RPRs and when I burn out a barrel, especially in six Creed, I throw another factory barrel on it. And they all shoot the same. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I tell people like, well, what type of load development you do? And I say, well, I go through the process because I feel like I should to be uh, diligent as a professional shooter. But my load ends up being the same. And I'm, you know, it's the same, you know, 41 grains of uh, 4350 with a 110 A-tip. It's, you know, whether I'm on my brand new gun or a bar, you know, I'm on my fifth barrel on that gun or my third gun or whatever it is. It's the same load. <laughs> well, and that speaks to the consistency of the manufacturing. I think that's, that's, that's exactly where, what I'm saying is the capability to repeat and refine that process where, you know, they can do 10 guns, 20 guns, a hundred guns, a thousand guns, and they're all going to be great. Right you have an expectation. You're not going to get one that shoots like a, you know, peach basket at a hundred yards. And then one that shoots a quarter minute. No, they're all shoot good. And and just like you're saying, so many guys that have started in PRS have, you know, even if they've evolved to a custom gun go, yeah, I started my RPR. That thing always shot great. And that's the first thing they say is that thing always shot great. No complaints, no complaints on the accuracy side. So yeah, um, it, it is remarkable. Uh, you know, how well uh, the manufacturing and, and what, what the consumer can expect. Well, but as gun guys, we just like to find reasons to buy more guns. So there's always that. Well, <laughs> of course. <laughs> we, the, the one gun that just, just works and shoots great, but you, you want to buy more guns. Um, so real quick, wanted to talk about, so you are so into this that now you are, you are, have a match match coming up that's your match. Tell people about it. Right. So uh, Keith Baker and I, and Keith, uh, for people who don't know him, he's top, you know, top level PRS shooter. And I, I met Keith a couple of years ago when I got started in this. And about a year ago, started talking. I said, you know, I, I really want to run a match, but I, I want to have, you know, you need help. I mean, you do. You, one person, you can't do. And these matches are big and mm-hmm. it's very involved. And I wanted to, you know, tie somebody in with a lot of experience, not only in PRS, which he's got, you know, five, six years, seven years in it, but he's a hunter, long range hunter, uh, used to, you know, be a pro bass fisherman. You know, he's done a lot of stuff at at that level. So it was a a really good fit. So uh, we are, uh, Canning Shooting Sports is running a national two-day match that's presented by Ruger. You know, it's basically, you know, it's Ruger's match. Sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of running and handling all the logistics and we're running it at cameo shooting complex in grand junction, Colorado, uh, June 12th and 13th. And it's a phenomenal facility. When I, when I had yeah. talked to Walt there and, and had seen some video, I still didn't really believe what he was telling me. And I heard, we were talking about this before we got on. I heard about this and I ran into Walt at some event a couple of years ago and he's telling me, yeah, the state of Colorado, uh, 
Division of Wildlife. Division of Wildlife is helping put this thing together and it's going to be amazing. And I'm going, this sounds pretty cool, but describe this range that they are. I mean, I guess they're still completing it out, but it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's set up. It's, it's sick really. So, you know, you have the clubhouse and, and that's, that's a process, but it's, it's, they've got enough room in there to hold the seat. I think 600 people, if you want to have a banquet there, Jeez. they've got 40, uh, six seat UTVs on hand for people to, to use, to run around the range. They've got multiple covered with Wi-Fi. Uh, pistol bays, rifle bays, you can shoot uh, from right there at the clubhouse, the 200-yard range, steel targets from 100 to 600 and some yards. Wow. They've got, I believe, 12, 14, and I might be wrong. There's there's a bunch of what I'll call pistol, IDPA, USPSA, steel challenge bays that are all level with a transit. I mean, just immaculate place. And that's just that portion. And then mm-hmm. you go up into the valley and they've got two world-class sporting clay courses that Neil Chadwick had set up. They have a, what they call the terrain park where I'm running the PRS side of things, which is a couple thousand acres of Colorado beauty yeah. and scenery to be able to run this match <laughs> for everybody. And it's going to be awesome. Well, in PRS, obviously precision rifle series, you need some distance. You need some land um, which certain parts of the country, we're down here in the deep South to have any distance, you have to knock down trees, right. Um, out in Colorado. I mean, this is big country. And so it's perfect for that type of thing. They have a ton of acreage, I guess. Yeah. They've got thousands of acres. It used to be a, a mining town and an old mine. Um, so it's all reclaimed. So there, it, it's a big area. And I'd say for the, the shooter that wants to shoot long range and that, and that's the thing the kind of the tweak of our match, the theme of the match is going to be a Western theme, obviously, you know, I tell people expect to maybe shoot off a coal cart or a stagecoach or, <laughs> you know, all the props are going to be natural, you know, uh, cedar trees, rocks, all that type of stuff. We're not going to have a very few man-made type props okay. to shoot off of. We want it to be a real natural field course and the bulk, probably 80% of our targets are going to be animal type targets instead oh, of your traditional cool round plates or diamonds or squares. We're going to have some of those, but we have, uh, I actually just saw the final list this morning and some pictures we've got, you know, half size mule deer, uh, antelope, prairie dog, bear, uh, you know, all sorts of animal targets, you know, bass pro shop has jumped in as a sponsor. So don't be surprised if you're shooting at bass looking steel targets <laughs> awesome. out at sure. six or seven, 800 yards. Why not? <laughs> Why not? I, and it makes it feel kind of sounds like it feels like a Western hunting type of set. And that, that is what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to, again, blend the hunters with the shooters and the shooters with the hunters. We're hoping that, and maybe not year one, but maybe year two or year three, that some some hunting guys see this and go, hey, that looks like a lot of fun. We're mm-hmm. You know, that can be... Uh, that can work for me as a hunter. I can go do this and and hone my shooting skills. Shooting an I don't really care about shooting you know round plates all the time. But if I can shoot at a an antelope target or a coyote target at five hundred and hit that, then that shot on that mule deer at three hundred doesn't look so difficult. Absolutely. And I think with that theme, with where we are and how we were you know planning on running, and I I think it's going to be a great mix and a, and a total feel our own feel, you know, yeah. from what other matches are out there. And that's, that's what I was really looking for. I wanted to, to run a match where it's going to be epic. It's going to be a destination match and it's a, a match, not only for the shooters, but for the sponsors, I want it to be an event, right? Not just a match. You right. know, I've been in this game a long time and matches are fun. Competition's fun, but we're a family, right? I want it, I want it to be all encompassing. And I'm telling shooters, Hey, Bring your shotgun, you know, stay an extra day, go shoot some sporting clays. We're working at maybe being able to have a day. Uh, I'm still logistically working on, we can take, you know, a few groups out prairie dog hunting, maybe the day after the match. Sure. Absolutely. I I want it to just, you know, I want it to be a week long at some point, a week long festival. Right. Right. It's It's a destination. And it's one of the things that whether it's your local match or a big destination match like this is you're also kind of spending some time with some like-minded folks and you get to be friends with these people. And, and nowadays it's maybe even a little bit easier to stay connected with them uh, across States and that kind of thing um, with, with social media and all right. that stuff. 
are are there still spots available if somebody was interested in doing it? Yeah, there's still spots available. I mean, we originally were, were capping it at 100 shooters, but I think we're going to, you know, as the interest continues to grow, and it is, I mean, the funny thing is not only from the just pure competitors, but now a bulk of the sponsors that have jumped in are saying, well, well, we want at least one slot. We, we mm-hmm. want to send four guys. We <laughs> want to send three shooters. So all of a sudden I'm going like, okay, well, I'm going to have 40 or 50 industry right people come shoot it so you know we'll we'll accommodate we'll make it work we we easily can the facility can handle it logistically we can handle it um but we'll probably cap it cap it at a maximum of 200 this year yeah um you know i mean my target goal would be around 150 but there's still slots available there's still a few sponsor slots available but you know for anybody that wants to you know shoot a different type of match and nothing against the matches that are you know, one uh, common firing line and, and you move down, those are great. They're efficient. You can get through them quick. You get a lot of shooting done. But if you're looking for something different uh, and a field type course, if you're a guy that likes to hunt, this this is going to be a match that's got a nice blend for you. And again, you don't have to bring a PRS rig, bring a, you know, bring a, a Ruger American rifle and yeah. six Creed and you bring your hunting set up and and bang away at some steel. I could see that being a real appeal because you could kind of go out there and go, look, I don't care if I win, but I like the idea of having all these different setups and rests and rocks to shoot from and all these different targets at different distances. It's just a personal challenge and a fun activity for Absolutely. a couple of days. And it, and it gives you an opportunity to learn your equipment. You know, you mm-hmm. can learn to dope on your rifle and whether you put a dope card on your gun or you have, you know, a scope that you're dialing, whatever it is, running a Kestrel, whatever it is, it's all knowledge and experience to, you know, and if, again, if you're a hunter to take in the field, I mean, I tie it right into, you know, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate to go hunt the Deseret with Bruce Pettit from Leupold. Um, we went to go hunt elk and, uh, you know, I was, he and I were hunting together and so, as his guest, he allowed me to be kind of first up, right? I was, I was kind of the main hunter first. So we hunted for, for two, two and a half. We were into the third day hunting really hard. And we've been kind of working these, these elk and chasing this one bull. And we never really got a great look at him. And we came over this hill and, and we caught this old bull. Wasn't the biggest bull, but the guide had told me, you know, he's, he's probably a 12 year old bull would be a good one to, wow. good one to shoot. And he's, again, he's still a 310, 320 inch bull, not a small bull, but, but he was far. It was like, we ranged, he was like 650 and I was still on the fence. Cause you know, I know that there's some giant elk at this place. And this, to me, this was going to a hunt of a lifetime. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, if there's a 350, 360, you know, if that opportunity is there and I looked at Bruce and he looked at me and he goes, he goes, that shot would be epic. <laughs> and I go, you're right. Okay. So I, lay down my bipod. I got to have my fanny pack on. I took that off, used some rear support, hit the range finder, dialed my dope, checked my wind. I had my Kestrel, had all my stuff, everything that I learned shooting PRS. Yeah. And now that 650 yard shot now to a guy that's a hunter and you you can have your question on ethics, but. Well, I I was going to say that when you shoot a ton and I'm sure there's also an evaluation of is my rest good enough? Is the, are the conditions good enough? What's the animal doing? I mean, that had to be a factor as well. It's all a factor. And even leading up to that, I flew out to Oregon and Leupold has their range over at Madras. And we, Bruce and I went over and spent two days shooting. We shot out to over a okay. thousand yards got with our hunt, up. with our hunting gut set up, with our packs, with our bipods, with all our stuff. We videoed it. We, That's you know, awesome. we kind of did a little training deal. You yeah. know, we, we tried to simulate stuff. So we knew the guns, we knew our setup Again, once I got, and I, I told him at the time, if I get down and I'm steady and, you know, and there was virtually no wind, teeny little bit of wind, I counted for all that stuff. And, you know, first shot impact, you know, he stood up, he was running. The hardest thing about it was he was running off another bull. He had a bunch of cows with him. So mm-hmm. they're in the middle of the rut. So it's like, you know, he was on Coke, you know, I mean, he was totally out of his mind, right. adrenaline juiced up, ready to fight anything and anybody. So when he circled back around and was just standing there bugling, you know, I put it on him, I, I hammered him, you know, at 650 and he just took it. I mean, he just stood there like, oh, hey, yeah, what was that? When you got your adrenaline up, you, you don't realize <laughs> exactly. you've been punched. Yeah, exactly. And then he, he went off and, and I got another one in him and, and he went down and that was it. But I would never have been able to take that shot number one 
without the experience and the knowledge that I learned shooting this long range game. And that's, that's fact. And I've shot other animals at long distances, but I'll be honest. I, I think there was, I don't want to use the word luck, but my shooting skill tied in with knowing, and I knew my equipment then too, but I didn't still didn't have the wind knowledge and the dope knowledge of, you know, what all the trajectory was and just all the variables that can come into play. And, and Bruce and I did have that discussion. He's like, I wouldn't have let, you know, been involved with anybody else to take that shot yeah, in the that's, field. That's starting to get, for most people, that's getting further than probably you'd recommend for hunting. Absolutely. But, but you know, you're not Doug Koenig. So. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having Super me. Super fun. Uh, very cool. We'll see you next time on Gun Talk Nation.